what is up with this? I'm jumping, I'm jumping ahead. Why is this thing not drawing correctly? Um, so yeah, so uh, so Megan just asked. So after this, we'll talk about the our seafood surveys and updates and alternative assignments and and where people are and all that kind of stuff when we, when we finish here. So uh, we will be talking about that next. Um, okay, you guys. So uh, want to finish up with our last official chat, which is going to be about um, hope. So sometimes I think I'm accused of bumming you guys out. Sometimes I. I talk about all the problems and oh my God, this cliff's eroding and oh my God, this thing is over harvested and all this and that. And um, those are all real things. And I, I, I don't apologize for talking about things sometimes in a, in a stressful way or whatever, because we do need to go in with our eyes open. But I don't want to leave you guys with the impression from this class, particularly since we haven't been able to go out and about and do a lot of the, um, see a lot of the success stories that we typically do. That... There's, there's lots of reason for hope. And I'm not saying that because of just to be, you know, Pollyannish or just to be like, oh, let's be great. But, but there really are some um, lots of positive signs that um, we know what to do. Granted, there's lots of challenges out there, steep hills to climb, things of that nature, but you should not lose hope. We've come a tremendous way even though it doesn't always seem like it. Um, and things can always be better. We've made lots of errors and mistakes and, and continue to make mistakes, but, but don't let that be your main um, frame of reference. There's always hope. And so to start with, um, I just wanna mention a couple of successes really quickly. Coastal water quality. Um, we, uh, you know, have the modern version of lifeguards, um, which really, in, in, a, in, a, in a, the professional, the profession of lifeguarding really got going um, in a big, real way in the early 1900s here in Southern California um, because of some, some import, some, some Australians and some people that came here and were visiting and saw what we were doing. So this is stupid. Um, it used, it used to be uh, people were in Santa Monica, in Venice Beach, places like that. And they would go out in the water and they wouldn't know how to swim because most of our population didn't necessarily learn to swim. And so the, the ocean was a bit of a scary place and people would drown. And so we originally ran ropes from the, from the land down out into the, to a buoy out in the sea. So if you started to get caught in a rip current or something like that, the idea was you, would, you could self-rescue by pulling yourself up. Well, some of these, you know, athletic folks that knew how to swim when they saw this they were like this is stupid right we should just train people to be professional lifeguarders and and monitor the coast when we started doing that though one of the things that became quite clear because these lifeguards were frequently going in the water they were getting all kinds of nasty diseases we're talking the 1910s 1920s in southern california in the greater los angeles area they're getting you know all these waterborne diseases because essentially our sewage was flowing raw out into, um, in that case, Santa Monica Bay, but all around the world, it was same, very similar thing happening. Um, we have microplastics to be sure. We have, we have you know, PFAS, we have other substances that are, that are pollutant waters to this day, but we've made huge strides in terms of water quality, huge strides if you compare what the situation was 100 years ago in the coastal zone, in the urbanized coastal zone to, to now, um, lots of improvements. And, and don't, don't underestimate how important those have been. The ozone hole, my thing, when I was where you guys are, an undergrad, the big stressor, the thing that dominated the news and was freaking everybody out was ozone um, depletion from chlorofluorocarbons. Um, we got together. Nations of the world got together. Nobody forced them to. We got together under the Montreal Protocol, and people agreed to, um, you know, start phasing out the use of these harmful substances um, that were, you know, in some cases used as refrigerants, but in other cases were used as, you know, fire, you know, um, substances that 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 were fire retardants, things that were solvents in industrial processes. So it was a non-trivial thing. It wasn't just, oh, get rid of those we had to find some serious um, alternatives and they're still being phased out. 
the, just like climate change, just simply stopping to use these substances didn't solve the problem because there was inertia in the system. The, the ozone hole is, it can, you know, continued to grow, continued to grow, continued to grow. We seem to have maybe peaked around now, but the ozone hole is not go, a hole. It's more of a thinning. It's not really a hole per se, but, but um, pr primarily around um, Antarctica. Um, it's, it's you know, going to take probably you know, many more decades to 100 years or so to, to get to the pre-disturbance level, but we're on the way. This seemed totally impossible to get Russia and China and the US and France and the Philippines and everybody around the planet to agree, but we did and we got through it. So that's, a, that's an example of a success. That's not exactly coastal success, but the ozone depletion was having tremendous impacts on coastal food webs and predicted to have massively devastating effects on things like the Antarctic food web. Um, whale populations, krill, phytoplankton, et cetera. So, so uh, that's a success story. Combating invasive species. So uh, Dr. Lambrinos, when he spoke about invasive species, you know, sometimes they seem daunting and all these pompous grass are everywhere and all this and that, but we do know how to combat invasive species. This summer, um, uh, uh, or actually not the summer, but, but this during the pandemic, so last spring, excuse me, um, we accidentally imported a, an invasive species over to, uh, to one of our islands in the Channel Islands. But because we have ex had existing sentinel monitoring, we caught it and we, we, we caged that rat and we got that rat and we caged it up and it's gone. So, that, so we can stop invasive species. We've removed invasive species from the California Channel Islands, right? We've removed wild boar. Um, we, 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 we can do this. Hard to be sure, challenging to be sure, costs money, takes some time, but we can do it. This notion of we're, we have to throw in the towel, that's not correct. The California Coastal Act, an imperfect creation to be sure, but nevertheless, very, uh, on, on average, I would say a great success for coastal preservation, for coastal dependent industries, for coastal access for all, as opposed to the wealthy or the elite. Um, and uh, we have some examples of fishery successes. So we often hear about we're over harvesting, over depleting fish stocks around the world. I say that all the time and we are, but where we've applied our, our rigor, we've applied our tools, our, our learning um, of what works and what doesn't work in coastal management, we've actually had some, some great success with our fish stocks. The question is whether we, can, whether we have the wherewithal to apply those lessons you know, at a larger scale, but the fact remains we do have, there are bright points in terms of our fish populations as well. Um, so those are just a couple really quick to get us going. And so next uh, I've tossed in the chat, this poll EV. So this is, you can take it up to three times uh, and you can, this is gonna say, you know, so pause for a second, we'll pause. We'll take a, you know, three, four minute break here. And I want you guys to um, think about it for a second. What's an example, what's a coastal management success story um, to you? It could be a relatively small example or a relatively local example. It could be a larger example. But, but uh, I'm gonna give us say three minutes right now. And I want you guys to give me at least one success, coastal success story. You can just jot a word down or, or a couple, you know, a phrase. Um, and at least one, but up to three. So I'll give you guys three minutes. Click that link, that poll EV link. You can use this QR code if you have your phone up and want to just do it from your phone. Otherwise, you can just click the link. And I'm going to start on three minutes right now. Okay. So cool. Now, so there's a little bit. So um, someone said Marine Protect Area. Somebody else said MPAs. So I'll have to go through in the final list here after today. I'll just go and look in in in. Uh, for my own interests, see some of these things might, might combine. But for right now, looks like the number one uh, most successful story or things you guys thought was was a cool cool aspect of coastal management, uh, the recovery of California sea otters, <clears throat> which is cool. Um, uh, so we have sea otters. We have the recovery of bird populations impacted by DDT. Again, DDT, an unintended consequence. We didn't know it was going to impact the birds, but we figure out it was a problem. We, we, um, you know, 
ceased making it. We kept shipping it overseas to other co countries for a while, but, but uh, nevertheless, we started on the road to not using that substance anymore. Um, and so we have both DDT, uh, this guy with nine with the Pelicans and with the bald Eagles. I would, I would say those are sort of same, same success story. They're, they're tightly related. Uh, uh, limiting coastal development, that's a cool thing. Um, snowy plover protections, okay. So in particular, probably fencing, I suspect what you guys are thinking of. Um, MPAs, again, so that, that seven would be added to, or sorry, so MPA seven here and this there, and then four here. So it's actually about 11 or so for that, that vote. So that would be put it up into number two, MPAs, Marine Protected Areas, so cool. Um, the notion of uh, repatriating um, remains that were originally taken off to be in a museum or be in some kind of research lab or whatever and treating those um, remains and artifacts with respect and acknowledging um, the, um, the status and the validity of First Nations, uh, uh, Chumash and others, um, is, a, is a huge thing. Um, Recovery of island fox populations. Again, we have a seven and a six, probably the same thing together. So there we go, it's probably about 13. Um, bald eagles, again, wow, man. So DDT is gonna like, look at that, DDT is like, uh, it's on it, it's, it is cranking. Um, here's another one, a return of the California condor to the big, I think, Sur Coast we're looking for. No, no, an extra E on there, but the big Sur Coast, very cool, very, very cool. Ventura County, the epicenter for the recovery of that endangered species, once down to only 24 or 26, I think 24 birds in the wild and we captured all those and, and now we're up into the uh, many hundreds and if we add up the populations across the west, uh, over a thousand now, so very cool. Um, people taking responsibility for cleaning up stuff, okay, cool. Uh, uh, limiting fishing for abalone, cool. Um, uh, decline the popularity of shark fin soup, locally, yes. Uh, I don't know if it's declining necessarily all over the world, but but certainly in, in some areas in small island nations and in um, places like California, absolutely. Um, another vote for the Coast Commission, sort of general vote for the Coast Commission. Um, awareness of overfishing, another more DDT. We love our DDT here. A dolphin safe. So again, sort of related to the overfishing and other ways of harvesting seafood. So that's cool. Uh, Trestles and um, uh, San Onofre, that's, we haven't talked about that very much in our class, but basically that is the effort, it was the effort to um, essentially put a transportation corridor right next to the coast that would have fragmented sta a state park there and a classic surf spot and, and other things and that um, so far has been um, defeated. Um, although there's, there's still constant pressure to do something uh, to fragment that habitat. Uh, accessibility. So the general idea, again, with Coast Commission, sort of coastal access, that's another one great. Ooh, a vote, a vote for coastal research, that's cool. Um, coastal access to the public and access and then uh, MPAs, so, so cool. All right, so those, those, are, those are, that's a great list, you guys. Those, those, are, those are cool, I like that. Um, it's important to say that all these things we've talked about in our class about perceptions of coastal versus inland, um, different demographics of people at the coast and inland, all that stuff is definitely real. Here's, uh, before we start our lecture today, I just went and grabbed this map from the New York Times. In this case, this is about COVID cases per 100,000 folks. And what we see is the greatest intensity at the moment as we're recording this in fall of 2020, right? the greatest uh, incidence is in the Midwest. And we see on a per capita basis, at least, much lighter on average infections in the coastal zone. Recall when the, in the early days of the epidemic, it was the exact reverse, right? We were having the most intense outbreaks in the coastal zone. But the fact remains, however you look at it, um, people are, um, for example, behaving in the context of this pandemic differently if they're inland versus in a coastal region. That's a real thing, right? This isn't made up. This isn't somebody's interpretation of data. This is a, a true phenomenon. And it, again, it, it solidifies the idea that we started the class with, which is there is something distinct about the coastal zone that's worthy of study and management and particular concern 
that isn't necessarily representative of what's going on in inland areas. Um, and then uh, one of the true values of the coast, and so th this was a, a picture of folks doing um, increased harvesting during the pandemic when people maybe couldn't get out, maybe didn't have as much as many jobs. And so people were looking for some extra food, maybe do some seafood stew, that kind of stuff. In this case, these are folks visiting um, uh, Pal the Palos Verdes uh, Peninsula in Los Angeles. But we saw this up and down the coast. People, you know, initially we were banned from the coast, banned from our beaches and things in the early days. But now as we enter, we're entering another stay at home, another lockdown, um, in LA County and, and also throughout the um, state of California to greater and lesser degrees. But people have, but the, uh, the government, the county supervisors, the governor, whoever it is, understands that while we do need to socially distance even when we're outside and wear masks and all that kind of stuff, the notion of completely cutting people off from the coast or, or from the beach or outdoor recreation opportunities, that's not a good thing, right? that it's actually safer to be outside than it is to be indoors. And there's mental health, physical health, all these aspects that we get from, from a healthy coastline. And so while maybe we don't want these folks over harvesting these mussels in these areas, it really highlights the value and the importance of having public access and, and, and being able to go to these places for a variety of reasons. And we derive a variety of benefits from the coast, even in pandemics. Again, the coast is real. So here is voting from earlier this month um, in terms of how we voted. In this case, this is just a couple, I just grab, grab a couple of random maps. This is Prop 15 to change our tax base and then Prop 16 to reinstate affirmative action. Um, and again, coastal California, it, counties touching the coast tend to behave differently from inland counties. And we see that again and again. So the coast, again, is real. It's real in terms of management challenges. It's real in terms of different um, demographic um, profiles. It's real in, in all these ways we want to talk about. And sometimes we hear these terms of coastal elite and all that kind of stuff um, as a derisive thing. Um, and, and we don't want to be elitist, but, but the fact remains there really there are honest differences in coastal versus inland areas. And we've seen that throughout the semester. Next, I just want to say that generally we know what to do, right? Not always, not entirely, not every situation, but for the vast majority of situations, we know at least at a minimum what direction we should be heading in. In a lot of cases, we actually know how we can, how we can surmount this obstacle. And so right here, I'm showing you guys in the lower left, Surfer's Point, where we, I mentioned we have the manage retreat and it's an example of how to do manage retreat uh, in a very professional, very effective way. People look to this from across the state um, to the area right by the fairgrounds and in, in near downtown Ventura. Um, as a model, people look to this from the East Coast as to how to do it. People look to this from across the planet as to how to do a managed retreat in a responsible way that benefits both people, um, the economy, tourism, um, and protects the environment at the same time. One small example is what's, what's being planned right now up in Sonoma County. Had we been able to go on our trip, we would have seen an, another example of this in um, San Luis Obispo County, but the fact remains there are examples up and down the coast where we have eroding coastlines. In this case, we're, we're talking about, um, while, while this was the fairgrounds and the, and the public uh, bike trail, bike path, uh, this is PCH um, in Sonoma. And this is essentially the main thoroughfare for a lot of folks in this part of Sonoma County, certainly key to the ecotourism and the, and the tourism industry. If this, if this PCH fails, all the bed and breakfast, all the parks, all the businesses, all the restaurants, all the tourist places, all that kind of stuff would, would screech to a halt. Um, this past year or two, we've had in, in many cases De the PCH down to a single lane because it's corroded, it's eroding. You can see it crumbling down into the, to the uh, Pacific Ocean. We're going forward. We're in the process of moving this a couple hundred feet inland, uh, not quite a mile length of PCH moving it inland. We've had to purchase some private property to be able to do that as the state has, um, but it's required agencies working together 
it's required a bridge, just a bridge over a, over, over a creek. Um, point is, we can do it, right? We know how to do this. A lot of these challenges take money, take time, take commitment and expertise, which you guys hopefully will be engaged in as you graduate. But, um, but don't think that these, these are impossible things to figure out that we're never going to be able to make progress on. And I would argue that it's important to have your plans ready. Even if you don't have your money yet, even if you don't have all the ducks in a row, get your plans in order. Because oftentimes these things present as a crisis. They present as PCH falling into the water. They present as a hurricane coming in. They present as a wildfire coming through. At that point, the public is ready to try a responsible solution. And if you have the plan done, or at least the vast majority done, you can hand it to them and say, what if, we, what if we try this? If you have to start from scratch, a lot of times we actually might miss the boat. We might not, we might not have the time to develop a plan. So you guys know how to deal with all these various coastal management challenges. You should be moving forward with your plans and your thoughts and your ideas. Even if we don't yet have everything in order, it will be in order at some point in the near future. And you want to be ready to pull the trigger when that, that um, triggering event happens. Um, it's also important to say that our coast has improved, not just in water quality and things like that, but it just physically it's improved, right? It doesn't seem that when we talk, maybe it doesn't seem that way when we talk about sea level rise and coastal armoring that we always talk about, but it has, right? This is what, uh, you know, parts of Santa Barbara, this is what parts of Long Beach, this is what parts of a lot of our coast look like 100 years ago, right? Or 110 years or so ago. That sucks. I mean, I, I, I don't care who you are. That just, that just sucks. You know, uh, these are all oil rigs up and down, uh, sucking out oil out of the ground. And as important as oil was for the economy and all this and that, this seems a little crazy. This seems perhaps not the best use of our rare, prized, um, um, scarce coastal zone. And so realize that one of the reasons the Coastal Commission had the success that the Coast Coastal Commission had was an earlier generation saw this. And they said, yeah, no, mm -mm, don't like that, right? We think the coast would be better used for other things. Set aside as a park, houses, uh, recreation, fishing, all these things more important than just throwing up some oil rigs, which could be, you know, in a sense anywhere. Back in the day when the technology was very primitive, it was harder to be anywhere, but, but very quickly it became clear that they did not have to be right there. And that was the vision of, of the community being engaged with this um, back in the day before this was all super expensive houses and whatever, right? So that's cool. That turned into this, right? That by eliminating those ugly things and those dangerous things and those polluting things, it made the coast open for recreation. Now we might look at this and say, <laughs> okay, that's maybe a little too much recreation. Maybe it'd be nice to have a little bit of breathing room to be sure, but, um, and we need to manage our large populations to be sure. But, but the fact remains that this is a success story, right? People want to go to the beach. People want to go recreate. People see value in going to the beach. And back in the day, you know, people would go in these big stuffy bathing suits and, uh, and, you know, very wool and clothing, you know, nowadays we see the beach as, a, as more of a, of a free place by and large, right? A place where we can go swim, a place where we can go sit with our family, a place where we can take our kids to go run and build sand castles and all that kind of stuff. And that, again, all made possible, that cultural shift all made possible because we, we chose a different path for the development um, and, and the valuation of the coastal zone right here in Southern California. Coastal access, uh, a, another thing that, that is, is um, a key part of the coastal, uh, coastal act, the thing that you guys all, all, or many of you highlighted there in our, in our polling. Um, but if anybody wants to do anything to the coast now, change access, do a add-on, whatever, they have to post a notice, right? So it can't just hide. It can't just be, you know, disappeared in some government vault somewhere. So if you're walking through and, and or driving through or, or passing along in a bus or whatever, and you see this and you're like, ah, 
that's cool. I can find out about that. I can voice my opinion and your opinion is actually taken into account. Doesn't necessarily always carry the day in terms of what, what course you would like things to happen, but, but coastal access is a hugely, hugely important uh, thing and a powerful tool that we get thanks to the Coastal Act, which our colleagues in other states, again, don't, uh, unfortunately, don't necessarily have um, in terms of uh, uh, the ability to, to weigh in on coastal access. Yes, our fishery status. So, question so far about that. Make it sense? Yep, making sense. Hope, hope. It's positive, people. We're po talking positive stuff. Um, so, to be sure, we've depleted a lot of our global fish populations and, and fish stocks and all that. That that's true. But the response of Chicken Little here on the left to just say. Oh my God, it's the end of the world. Oh my God, we can't do anything. Oh my God. Again, I would tell you guys that's the wrong approach. That's the wrong approach. Um, we might be depressed. We might lose a battle here. We might, we might lose this effort to do this action or that action. But on average, we know what to do. On average, with rigorous science, uh, 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 factual support, testing of hypotheses, support for what works, that is the recipe for success, not just for getting published in an academic journal. That's the recipe for success to get people to buy in. And marine reserves really have grown over the last 20 years in terms of public buy-in, even fisher, um, fishing community buy-in, that they, they have some value and they are a useful tool. So uh, last, I want to just finish off with a couple examples of some local fisheries that I think are an example of, of hope or, or reason for hope. Um, so we'll start right here with, uh, so Jeremy probably recognizes this, yeah? No, he doesn't. Oh my God. Oh. Uh -huh. Yeah, okay, right, okay. Is, uh, ho hopefully somebody else recognizes it, but this is, this is a white sea bass. Yes. This is a, a very tasty fish, very popular game fish here in, in, in um, coastal Southern California. You can get this in restaurants, but it's not, it's not like a you know, mass produced thing. It's, it would be sort of more like your, your, your fish specialty, your seafood specialty, okay. you know, restaurants type of thing. So, uh, okay, let's talk about the white sea bass. So here we go. So we have the landings. Again, we have metric tons right here on the y-axis. And then we have years through time here. And you know, so we were catching some, we're not catching as much, we're catching some more, the typical story. And then, you know, post-World War II, we start taking a lot and taking a lot and woohoo, taking a lot. And then we, we essentially take too much as we often do. And, and the, the, the catch starts this long-term decline. Okay, so there we go. So early 90s, less and less white sea bass, fewer and fewer white sea bass. Um, oh my God, the world is ending and we can't do anything about it, right? Well, if we extend the graph off a little bit more, check it out we get this little burp. So it's, it declined, the landings declined, 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 and then it kind of burped and it started going up. So something changed here, 1994. Anybody know what that is? Or anybody know what that was? Oh, somebody's putting in the chat maybe an answer. Uh, so Jeremy said they have a local hatchery over the harbor. Yes, true. Regulation. Uh, some regulation, yes. Yes. What what specific regulation? Uh, Anybody know? Banning of gill nets. Exactly. Exactly. <sighs> good guess. Good or not guess. I, that, that was a lame thing to say. Excellent answer, I should say. That was a good answer. So uh, 1990 um, proposition process, which oftentimes we see as sort of a big pain in the butt because so many people these days seem to abuse it. And, we, and every time we go to vote, we have a long list of propositions and they're sometimes hard to figure out what to do. But um, in this case, this was proposed as a gill net ban um, in, southern, in central and southern California. So what does that mean? So again, gill nets were the, are, are the type of nets that are also, also bait fish nets. But basically, they're nets that go out. They have the squares. Fish swim up to them. They poke their head through. Their, their gill covers, opercula, get stuck. And then they, they die, right? And so if you put it right in front of the fish you want, it's an easy way to get the fish but usually they're left out for longer periods and they have incidental take, so-called bycatch, right? 
and and so they they kill a lot of fish that um, you know you didn't need or can't use or or what have you. So this ban went into place, or sorry, the proposition came in 1990. It passed. It 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 enacted the ban in 1994. So it was four years for folks to get ready for it. Uh, and one of the other things it did was it actually raised a little money by, so when you get a fishing uh, permit, you get a fishing permit for the state of California. And then if you're going to fish in the, in salt water, you get what's called an ocean enhancement sticker. So essentially we changed, changed a little bit of the fees. And so raised a little bit of money from these, from these um, fishing fees. And we use that money to compensate fishermen that either lost money or had to buy new gear because of this gill net ban. So the idea was not to screw over the fishermen to understand that they would have to change, but to try to support them as well, as opposed to just saying, don't do this and walk away from it. So we got a four year phase in period, but the four year phase in period happens, boom, 1994. And then check it out. Post that, we start to see doo -ba -doo -ba -doo -ba -doo -ba -doo -ba doo 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 more white sea bass. Um, here is uh, some data from, um, uh, uh, yeah, well, here's a lot longer data. This is, this is now going to 2010, and you can see that trend continues, right? You guys with me? So, so the 1990s kind of up a duper 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 duper. Now, in this case, this is commercial landings, not just recreational, but, but you see the same pattern. And in, indeed, you can see, uh, see this through a variety of ways. One of the things we didn't really talk about, we didn't have time this semester to talk about, but, but one of the ways we, we measure landings is we standardize a per unit effort. One of, this, one of the common uh, standardizations is so-called catch per unit effort or CPUE. That can be standardized by the number of hours people are fishing. That could be uh, standardized by the number of vessels in the fishing fleet, et cetera. But however you do it, you standardize it. And so it controls for the fact that maybe back in the day there was a thousand vessels out fishing, whereas today there's only 20 or something of that nature. And when you do that, when we standardize the harvest based on the effort that we're putting into the harvest, and so in this case, this is metric tons per vessel, we see starting with 1995, 19, uh, um, the, the catch per unit effort is going up. So for the same amount of hours fished or the same amount of gasoline burned as we come out of the harbor, we're catching more fish. So that's great. That's saying that the, the, the population is more productive and is producing fish at a higher rate than it was before. So that's super cool. Um, and, and, and we see also importantly, more juveniles, right? So we're seeing more young fish born and, and more young fish encountered at different monitoring stations over this time. We're seeing that in a variety of things, both in the commercial and in the recreational fishing. So all these, all these slopes are going up. All these slopes are going in the right direction post the gill net ban. And indeed, uh, in fact, there might be a more recent record. I, I don't know because I haven't updated this in this talk in a year or two. But um, at least as of a couple of years ago, this was the world record, which is um, for spear fishing. So this guy speared. This guy Bill spearfished or speared this white sea bass off of Ma off of Malibu free diving, and almost a hundred pounds. Right, that's a huge fish. Um, while we can't say for certain that he wouldn't have caught this fish if it weren't for the gill ban, gill net ban, but it seems very likely that having lots and lots of gill nets out there would have made it very likely that this fish would have encountered one or more of those nets and very well might not have survived to this large age where it could have been killed by the spear fisherman. So even though that fish is dead, it, I think it's, it's, it's a hopeful sign that we're getting larger sized fish. Okay, so that was white sea bass. Anything else? Hey, how about what we used to call black sea bass, now we call giant sea bass. Awesome. I think I mentioned this, this species to you guys before, but super, super cool. This was the main apex predator on most of our California, central and southern California reefs and in, into Mexico reefs um, for a long time before we over harvested and, and, and drove them towards extinction. Um, 
so the, they're, and again, they're big. When you see them as, as an adult, they can be the size of a small VW bug. They're huge. They're really, really awesome. And they, and look at the size of this mouth. So, so this guy, when he opens his mouth, it could be, you know, yay big, right? So we can swallow, you know, a baby. <laughs> I don't know if they have any babies, but, but right. I mean, they, they, they eat whatever they could get in their mouth, lobster, um, other fish, whatever. So apex predator. Uh, yeah, and so they get up to 560 pounds, etc. Okay, same thing. So here we go. Here's here's uh, our landings back in the day, right? So here is uh, in this case, this is pounds, millions of pounds landed, and this is for commercial exploitation. And this is our time, right? So we're going here from 1916. So caught some, not not as many, some more, some not as many, and then we start getting into the woo, real heavy exploitation in the Great Depression. People eating them, mm, love, 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 love. And then we just keep whacking them and their population rapidly declines. There's a big debate as to why these happened, why this decline happened. Some people point um, to uh, spear fishing in particular as a reason and, and the birth of this modern spear fishing hobby and activity in Southern California and scuba diving with spear guns is one of the reasons because these guys were so big, you could walk up right to them and anybody could shoot this big giant target that wouldn't run away from you. Um, because they didn't run away from things because they were the apex predator. They didn't have a reason beforehand to run away from things evolutionarily. Um, and so, uh, so anyway, but regardless as to if it was caused by spear fishermen or, or fishermen, the fact remains they were over harvested and they were in decline. And indeed, this is an endangered species in California waters. You can harvest them in Mexico still. So we might see them in, in some of our seafood surveys, but um, uh, uh, in California, you're not allowed to take these guys. Uh, and this is a soup fin shark. Um, again, another uh, moderate size shark, smallish size, medium size shark species that is very common around us, but uh, whose numbers are in decline. Same with um, leopard sharks. Again, same thing, relatively moderate size shark. An adult of these guys is four feet or so. So they're not, they're not massive. Um, but, uh, and then these guys roam a lot. So the, these individuals will tend to hang out in the shoals in the shallow areas. Um, and, uh, oftentimes where there's a water outfall, so the water's a little bit warmer. They'll hang out there and then they'll, they'll cruise around all night. And so at Catalina, where we used to have these pot, well, they still are, but when I did my PhD or where they resided, they would, they would start in this bay and they would go halfway or all the way around Catalina Island in one night. So, so they, they, they oftentimes look very sedentary, but at nighttime they're very mobile. And so these would be an example of a critter that could be encountered quickly or quickly encounter um, gill nets uh, if they were deployed in the area. And so what do we see again with the soup fin and with the leopard shark um, catches sort of peak in the eighties and they decline, 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 decline. But as we start getting into the late nineties, early two thousands, the catch per unit effort of black sea bass, of the soup fin shark, of the leopard shark, they're going up, they're going up, they're going up. So that's telling us that these species are recovering, that their populations are getting more abundant. Um, and that's really cool. So, so again, particularly with black sea bass, we um, are not allowed to harvest them at all, even incidentally. And so they're protected. And they're a super cool critter, right? They're a charismatic thing. It's like a, a bunny or a puppy or an orca whale or something, right? Um, everybody can distinguish them. If you shot one of these critters or accidentally hooked it, you would know, right? It's, it's very different from the, the other fish in the area. So there's, there's, there's um, um, a strong likelihood that the, that the um, efforts to not harvest it are working, but we needed that extra little bump from the gill net that was indiscriminately harvesting these indiscriminately killing juveniles of this species before they could get large, um, which seems to be happening. And so for example, we're starting to see this. So in areas where we've been doing surveys for a long period of time, we wouldn't see them. And so this is where they became an endangered species or, or, or actually first listed as threatened and then became endangered. But, but where, the, where the legal protections started, didn't do anything, right? didn't do anything. So we needed some more additional help other than just saying, hey, don't take these individuals. The populations were so hammered. It took the gill net closure. And then because these individuals are slower growing than some of our other 
um, than the white sea bass, for example. It took a few more years, but now we're starting to see boom, 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 boom. And actually now there's a, there's a citizen science project where you guys can report if you see these individuals and we're starting to see them in more and more places up and down the coast as the populations continue to recover and will recover over the next couple of decades um, because these fish are long lived. So pretty cool. So, uh, so we, we know what to do, right? There is hope. We, we can recover these fisheries. It's not all doom and gloom. It's not all, oh my God, we can't do anything. So white sea bass, soup fin shark, leopard shark, uh, giant sea bass, all these things show that we might not be saved yet. The populations might not be perfect. They're not perfect by any stretch of imagination, but they're absolutely on the right trajectory. So we have these conversations about how to manage our fish populations. Do not get sucked into the, the negative despondency of we don't know what to do and everything's crashing. We do know what to do. It's just a matter of going forward and applying the lessons that, that we've learned and that you guys have learned. And so uh, the last thing I'll say in terms of happiness and positive things is that, um, you know, it's important that you guys are engaged. So, you know, you guys are, most of you are getting ready to graduate. Stay, keep that engagement going. So some of you might work in the coastal zone. Some of you might work in um, doing ranger stuff. Some might do GIS stuff. Some might go into education. Keep involved, right? That's the secret. The secret to not getting despondent is to stay engaged, is to be involved, um, making our communities more diverse, making our communities more resilient, making our communities more sustainable. That's, that's what we all need to do. And, and it's, it's, uh, it, we need your guys' engagement. And, and I just want you to tell you that uh, it's a fun thing to be engaged because we get to be at the coast, right? So, uh, so it's cool. And I hope you guys stay engaged even after this class. Um, and so, yeah, so there we go. So I was, I was, I thought we'd, we'd do the ranking again, but, but I, you guys already visited them. We already discussed it. So, so there we go. So, um, so awesome questions, any questions about that or any other comments about coastal success stories? No, all good. I guess so I have a question. Quick, um, yeah, Nick, uh, or, or whoever, whoever. I'll add a quick, quick comment. I think a lot of people underestimate like our human ingenuity and our ability to fix a lot of problems. And I, I don't think the future is as bleak as a lot of people think it is. Totally, I, I, I very much agree. I think I, one of the things that's the strangest thing to me about sea level rise and about climate change is it's a it's. It's very different from how we've historically thought about things, right? We've, we've always been optimists in our, in our country, right? At least, at least the dominant culture, popular culture has been optimistic. Sometimes that wasn't, <laughs> wasn't always justified, right? Um, but uh, but that, that, that ingredient, that key ingredient of optimism really is, I, 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 I can't underestimate how important that is. And it's so weird to me to, to hear, oh my God, sea level rise, boo hoo, right? Or climate change, boo hoo. Opportunity, right? Let's solve this. Let's get on it, right? Opportunities for jobs, opportunities for new technology, opportunities for feeling, getting people empowered, opportunities for bringing communities that haven't traditionally been engaged into the into the fold and and bring everybody together and is a unifying thing awesome right totally awesome we don't need wars to do that a lot of times we've used wars in our society to unfortunately get people rallied we can rally around climate change right it's a scary boogeyman right okay let's let's take that bastard out right let's let, let's go after it and so so that ingenuity is is strange to me that we don't want to embrace that I would say that, I would say that, uh, I won't say his name, but, but one of my, one of our neighbors uh, that, uh, you know, he's been a little kid with my son and he, he went away to college this, um, this semester. And he's, he, I said, oh, are you applying for college last year? What are you applied to? And he said, oh, I'm, a, I'm applying to petroleum engineering programs. And uh, I, I, I felt like I failed. <laughs> 
I was like, you're doing what? He's like, yeah, I'm applying to petroleum engineering programs. I'm like, God, I failed. Um, anyway, so he's away at this big engineering school that does a lot of petroleum engineering and mining. And he calls me up a couple weeks ago and he says, hey, you know, Sean, can we talk for a minute? I'm like, yeah, sure, dude, what's up? And we start chatting and he basically says, I don't think I want to do petroleum engineering anymore. And I said, and I said yes, okay, cool. Um, but, but one, he decided he didn't want to do that. But the other thing was he started talking to, so the, he went to a big program with all these petroleum engineers. Um, and, and so his roommates are, you know, his roommate was from Houston, Texas and the oil industry and all that kind of good stuff. And, um, and when he met his roommates and talked to his parents and they're like, what are you here to do? And he said, I'm here for petroleum engineering. His roommate's parents who were in the industry said, yo, dude, don't do that. There's, there's way more interesting jobs out there. There's way more, uh, uh, there, there's much more energy and interest in other aspects of engineering. So the folks that are in the petroleum industry, not all, of course, but at least some are saying like, mm, this, ain't, this ain't the happening place that it was. This isn't the place where it'll just be bursting with ideas and new innovations other places will be. And so I think that that's very telling. But I, I, totally, I totally agree. I totally agree. Somebody else had a comment? No. Okay. All right. So, um, all right. Let me pause this. Dr. Ray, I do have a comment. When I was yeah. living down in Houston about uh, 10 years ago, I met a young man that had started a solar um, a solar company. Mm -hmm. And his backstory was that he was a petroleum engineer and he made a, a hunk of money that he decided he didn't want to be in that direction anymore. And he took that hunk of money that he made because he found a, a petroleum bubble somewhere. He took that money and he made a, uh, he built a major solar firm and they were doing business all over Houston, commercial oh, totally. and residential. Yeah, I mean, Texas, I, I think I just saw a story this weekend that Texas was, is on track to be the number one solar, or in terms of electricity produced from um, solar, they're on track to, to be number one. They're already number one, I believe, in wind generation. Um, just in terms of absolute quantity. And now they're, they're getting close to being on um, um, electric. So yeah, totally. Yeah, there's all kinds of opportunities. So yeah. absolutely. So the notion of that we only have to stick to this old technology because why? Because we have that technology. Why? Because we have that technology. Why? Because we have that technology. That's the opposite of innovation and engagement and in growth and, and, and vitality. So I think, I think folks are seeing the writing on the wall, even though the oil and gas industry is going, not going to disappear next week or anything like that. But, but there is, um, you know, there, there is, uh, it, it's, when you talk to the people that know what's up, they, they recognize that things are changing. Yes. And like you said, Exxon Mobil is one of the leaders in using solar and wind technology to pump the oil out of the earth right now, but still they're moving in, in that direction. But um, they also are very big on having their engineers and scientists in the environmental uh, um, restoration um, category. So, yeah, and I would say as you guys look at jobs, um, this is a little bit off our topic, but as you guys look for jobs, you guys should look at era energy, oil and gas industry, all that kind of stuff. They have compliance stuff. There's there's different ways to make change, right? And we have. We each have our different skill sets and our different uh, proclivities for things. So, you know, some of us um, are most effective making change from the outside, agitating from the outside. Some of us are most uh, maybe effective as a regulator or kind of inspector type person. Others are most effective inside the the organization. And um, and so I, I think I would I would encourage all of you to look at all of your environmental science job opportunities broadly writ and don't don't necessarily um, you know cut out options I know a lot of fantastic people that work for the oil and gas industry and I think the notion that these folks are all evil and, and horrible is completely wrong um, 
I think I think you you can have a great impact on the transformation of this this industry, and that's what we really we're talking about, right? We're not talking about destroying an industry. We're talking about transforming it from maybe a practice that's not as sustainable into energy production of a more sustainable um, fashion, right? So, so I think I think that's you guys should all consider that. Cool. Any other any other comments?